This is Pastor Laura coming to you live from Living Praise Christian Center South in Chatsworth, California. Good evening. Well, it's really good afternoon. Um, this is the Back to Basics class, and we're going to be speaking today on the baptism in the, in the Holy Spirit, baptism of the Holy Ghost. And um, there's a link in the chat room for you to get the uh, outline. And um, if you're watching us on replay or in the archives, you can find our Back to Basics outline at www.lpcc.tv. And in the right-hand corner, you're going to see our Back to Basics has a little triangular link there. And you click on there, and that should take you to our classes. And today's lesson is um, Lesson 9 and um, in our Back to Basics curriculum, which I'm writing down as we go. <laughs> so um, you can find your outline there if you're watching this in the archives. And that way you can follow along. Um, how you doing out there in Cyber Church World? What I'm doing for all of those watching on uh, replay is uh, we have a live chat going on at the same time as we're having this class. Um, this class is a, a foundational class um, curriculum, so to speak, to build a foundation um, on the Word of God is what the Bible has to say about things like the new birth, the who is the Holy Spirit, and how does His gifts operate in the world today and in the church today, and finding your gift, which we're going to go into the gifts of the Holy Spirit after this class. We'll, we'll be going that direction as the Holy Spirit leads us. And this is just to build a solid foundation. You know, we have a great uh, ministry school here, um, but not everybody feels called to ministry, but we're all called to be a part of the body of Christ. And so this is an advanced study just to get us rooted and grounded in the Word of God so we can rightly divide the Word of Truth and find out what the Bible has to say to us about many topics that affect our lives. So to follow along with the outline, just go ahead and go to lpcc.tv and go to the Back to Basics uh, page and find Lesson 9. Um, in the chat room, there's already a link in there so that you can go and um, open up your uh, um, <clears throat> outline. Now, there's, this, is a link, this is a big lesson, so I'm going to go as far as I can go. And if we need to table it till next week, then that's what we'll do just to make sure that I don't skip any of these foundational truths. There's a lot of misinformation. Um, not all churches teach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so I wanted to make sure that you had many scriptures to show you clearly without question what the Bible has to say about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So that being said, let's um, go ahead and begin in prayer. Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for this class and that you've orchestrated and designated this class for us to further our study in the things of God and in the word of God so that we can follow you, Lord, clearly. So I thank you now, Lord. I lay aside, you know, any kind of miscon any misconceived ideas of how this class is to go. You have a plan for this class, Holy Spirit. Have your way, Lord Jesus. I thank you that you speak through my mouth, Lord. Think through my mind. All of you and none of me, thank you that every person who tunes into Cyber Church, whether it's live or in the archives, oh Lord, those within the sound of my voice, that right now, Holy Spirit, that you make this class, this lesson, the Word of God, as an unhindered lesson that the Word of God breaches into our hearts and plants that seed deep in there. Lord God, if we've been taught anything that's that's incorrect regarding what your word says about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Use me to bring the word of truth because you are the spirit of truth, Holy Spirit. Use me today to teach this class the way you want it taught in Jesus' name. We have ears to hear. Thank you that you not only give me utterance, but that you give us, Lord God, as receivers of the word of God, that we receive the word today that is able to enlighten us and bring us to the place that you've called us to be. To, and, and we just thank you. We just give you all the praise and the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so on page one in your outline, um, the first thing I wanted to talk to you about is that baptism in the Holy Spirit is subsequent to salvation. It comes after the new birth. And Jesus spoke, spoke about it. And my first scripture references in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 5. <clears throat> and... Um, it says, and this is Jesus speaking, and this is after he was risen from the dead, and he appeared many times to the disciples and the followers there. This is uh, what he said when he assembled together with them. 
He commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, you have heard of me. For God truly, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. And then in Acts eleven sixteen it says, Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. And then if in John 7, excuse me, verses 37 through 39, In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay, so we see that it is referred to as there's, this, there's a, a, another baptism besides water baptism. There are three baptisms listed in the New Testament that you can find. You have number one is the baptism into the body of Christ, which is what happens at the new birth. When we're born again, the Holy Spirit comes into our spirit and recreates our human spirit so that we are born of God. Or the, the New Testament word is born again. Jesus used that terminology. And that is a work of the Holy Spirit. That's the first baptism, baptism into Christ and his body. The second one is baptism in water, and that baptism is an act of obedience, basically. You know, I received Jesus as my Savior. Now my outward demonstration and sign to those that know me and what I'm making my public profession by being water baptized. That's your, that's your public profession of your faith. And then there's the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which we just read some scriptures about that, and we will read a few more. So number one on your paper, this baptism. Gee, I can't even say it's a paper anymore. These days we're all streamlined, paperless. So in your e-lesson, <laughs> it says, number one, this baptism is an endowment or an anointing for pow of power for service. And here's some scriptures for you. Luke 24, 49. And behold, I, this is Jesus speaking, send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And this is Jesus speaking. It's in the same context as the first one we read where he said you're going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days thence. In that same conversation, he um, says this, that you'll receive power after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and into all the uttermost parts of the earth. So this power comes from the Holy Spirit's indwelling, right? He, but when we get baptized in the Holy Ghost, you receive power to be not only to, to be his witness. Your witness is your life demonstration the Holy Spirit, you know, he gives us power to stand against temptation and sin. And this is the, this is the first act of power is that he strengthens us to be able to say no to the things that maybe we had trouble with saying no before. The Holy Spirit's baptism um, is also called in other places as the baptism of fire. So he, he comes and he brings this fire, this refreshing also. There's a refreshing that comes. And this is an act of this Holy Spirit. This baptism in the Holy Spirit is a separate, um, it's not the same thing as the new birth. It comes after the new birth. You can't get filled with the Holy Spirit until you've been born again. The Holy Spirit used to come upon, remember we went over this in some of our previous lessons, he comes upon for service. Um, but when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, our inward uh, being we're changed we're born again so now we're alive unto God this is where we can when we can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and um, let's go number two in your notes Jesus is the one who's the baptizer and this is why as I said last week that we can have cyber church and we can have streaming services of our of all of our um, live services coming here from the, coming to you from the south and people can get filled with the Holy Spirit right over the Internet. How is that possible? Because it's not a man's work. It's a work of the Spirit. And there is no time and there is no distance in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, I will send him unto you. Uh, and so he's the baptizer. Let's look at this. And Matt, number two in your, in your notes, Jesus being the baptizer. 
Matthew 3.11. And this is John the Baptist speaking in this point. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Okay? So this is, this is in, in your notes also. Mark 1.8. I indeed have baptized you with water. Again, this is John the Baptist speaking. But he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Luke 3.16 says, John answered, saying unto them, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Hallelujah. John 1.33, And I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. Now, God the Father told John the Baptist that. That's powerful. All right, so number three in your notes. I want to go through all these. This is a long lesson. I want to make sure you get all these scriptures. Number three, okay, so the first one is that baptism is an endowment or an anointing of power for service. Number two is Jesus is the baptizer. Number three, it may take place, what? The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. May take place before or after water baptism. Now, I've been saved since 1982. And I, did, I came off the streets. I, didn't, I, was, I never came out of a denominational background or anything like that, so to speak. Um, and I've been at this church here at Living Praise Christian Center since 1988. So I haven't had a lot of experience in dealing with other churches, but I have dealt with lots of other believers. I've had lots of opportunity to speak with lots of believers who come from many different denominations. And I have noticed that there is some information out there that one church will teach, well, now you need to be water baptized first. And the other church might teach, well, no, you need to be baptized with the Holy Ghost, then you get baptized with water. But I'm here to tell you that there is no order to to these two things. It doesn't matter what order they're in. Water baptism is an act of obedience. Baptiz- baptism of the Holy Ghost is, is a subsequent to salvation. It's a separate thing. However, you have the, when you're born again, if you never get filled with the Holy Spirit, you still have him because he's the one that recreated your human spirit. I've also heard doctrine that from, from other you know, believers that have said that they have been taught that unless you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you're not going to heaven. And I'm here to tell you that's not true. <laughs> Okay, so if you don't want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's quite all right. As long as you're born again, that's the main thing, baby. We want to make sure that you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. So here are some scriptures to bring this point to you, um, that it doesn't matter which place water baptism or the baptism of the Holy Spirit come in. Here's two, diff- here's two different, I think I've got just two listed, yeah, um, situations. One where the Holy Spirit came upon them after they were batter- water baptized, and the next one is they came, the, they had uh, baptized uh, them after they got filled with the Holy Spirit. So let's read this. Acts 10, through 48. While Peter yet spake these words, he was preaching, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed, the Jews which, were, which believed, were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Pausing right here. I believe this is with um, um, the centurion. Um, I don't know why his name is escaping me right now. This is the first Gentiles that came to Christ right here. This is referring to the first Gentile uh, people who received the Lord Jesus upon Peter's. Remember Peter was fasting and he was on the roof and a sheet came down and the Lord said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And he said, oh, no, Lord, I haven't as much as touched anything that's unclean because he was a Jew and he followed the law. And so um, the sheet came down and said, you know, go rise, Peter, kill and eat. And he's, he, he said, no, it's unclean and I won't eat anything that's unclean. He said, and the, and the voice from heaven said, that which I've called clean, don't call unclean. Because see, before it was um, not acceptable for a Jew to go into a house of a Gentile would be considered unclean. And so here, this is the, the, the Jew, the, the Jerusalem church where, the, where came to Cornelius, thank you, Holy Spirit, Cornelius' house. And Peter preached to them. According to the word of the Lord, and this is what happened. 
right? So then they see, you hear and see in verse 45, and they of the circumcision, this is with the Jews, which believed, they were believers in the Lord Jesus, they were astonished. Why? As many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. How did they know? Four, verse 46, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So there's your first example, right? So they got filled with the Holy Spirit first, and they're like, well, we see they're filled with the Holy Ghost. Why shouldn't they get water baptized? And so that's what happened. Here's another instance in Acts chapter 8, verse 14. And then the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, and they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. So here you have water-baptized believers who were not yet filled with the Holy Spirit. And after they uh, got water-baptized, they were filled. So here's two instances, and there's many others in the Bible, but here's just two for right now to show you that there's no order to it. We don't have to get legalistic about these things. We just need to follow the Bible and, and uh, receive what God has for us. All right, number four, the most common evidence of being baptized with the Holy Ghost is speaking in tongues. Okay, here's a bunch of scriptures for you. Acts chapter 2, verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and what did they do? They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Acts chapter 19, 2 through 6 says, And he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. So that's the water baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So here we see that that is what the consequence of being filled with the Holy Spirit is speaking in other tongues. Tongues is called in a heavenly language because when a believer prays in tongues, it is to God and not to man. This is important. Wouldn't it be silly for me to just, I mean, just think about this, okay? We pray, we speak not unto men, but unto God. Let's read the scripture first. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. 1 Corinthians 14, 14 through 15 says, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, My spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit. I will sing with the understanding also. So we know that speaking in tongues is when we pray in tongues, we're not praying or speaking to anybody but to God. We speak unto ourselves and unto God. So it's it's out of order to go up to somebody and just say, you know, and pray in tongues as you're speaking to them. That's because you're not praying to them. <laughs> That's your heavenly language, and it's you're speaking unto God, not unto another human. The only place that tongues is used in the public worship is when the gifts of the Spirit are being poured out, and you have tongues, but then you're going to have interpretation also. All right? So number t- B on your paper Believers should speak with tongues. It is one of the signs that should follow the believer. So if you're a believer, I'm here to tell you, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit today. You can pray in your heavenly language today. God is not holding back from you. Why should believers speak in tongues? Because in Mark 16, it says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Note, it doesn't say if you don't believe and you're not water baptized. It doesn't say that, does it? It just says if you don't believe, you'll be damned. 
And then the next verse says, and these signs shall follow them that believe. So if you're a believer, part of your ministry is listed right here. In Jesus' name, we cast out devils. In Jesus' name, we speak with new tongues. It's, it's a work of the Spirit. All right? So here now I'm going to go. That was taken from, by the way, that's from our perfecting class curriculum. If you haven't taken perfecting class yet, I want to encourage you to get online. We have it in Cyber Church for you, taught by none other but our pastor, Dr. Fred Hodge. Hallelujah. It's wonderful. He wrote the curriculum. So I, I tell you what, I just really enjoyed listening to him teach it because I taught that curriculum for years. And I'll tell you, nobody can teach it like Papa. Amen, and that's on Cyber Church, so um, you can go online, and, and that's the perfecting class. I'm going to encourage you to take the class. Take the class. It's really wonderful. All right, so here we are. Now we're going to go into the Bible way to receive the Holy Spirit. Since we receive the same Holy Spirit that the early church received, you know there's not a bunch of Holy Spirits. There's only one Spirit of God. And so we can have him, his, you know, we have him in a measure, but we can have him to the overflow. We should have the same initial sign that they had, the Bible evidence, which is speaking in other tongues. <clears throat> in Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, we, I have listed some scriptures here. Now, we read this earlier. And being assembled together with them, Jesus, this is about Jesus, commanded them that they should not depart but wait for the promise. And, and that's the promise of the Holy Spirit. Look at Acts 2, 1 through 4. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come... They were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of, of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled, notice all were filled, all were filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Speaking in tongues is not, oops, I went too far in my notes, sorry. So speaking in tongues is not the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost is not speaking with tongues, but they do go hand in hand because the Holy Spirit is the one that gives us the utterance. He gives us the words to speak, but it's our vocal cords, it's our lips, it's our tongue, it's our, we're using, giving voice to the utterance of the Spirit, and so you don't have to engage your intellect to pray in tongues. That's the beautiful thing. And I wish I was, I had thought I wish I could have found this for you before the class, but I, ha I saw a video where they had actually done experiments of people praying in tongues. And they had put this one guy into an MRI machine and had him not speak in tongues and just to speak in English. And you could see the parts of the brain that would work to engage um, uh, articulate speech and to engage in speech. And so there were certain... Um, um, sorry. So you could see in the brain that this, the parts of the brain that are used for intelligent speech were engaged. They turned red on the, on the thing. And then they had him pray in the spirit, and he prayed in tongues. And when he prayed in tongues, that area was quit. The movement, the red, the red highlights in the uh, MRI ceased in that area of the brain, though he was still speaking. And it just goes to show you, just, I love it when science just proves what we've been saying all along, that the word of God is true. And so you don't have to engage your intellect to speak in tongues. All you have to do is yield your voice and your lips and your tongue to the Holy Spirit, and he will make intercession through you. Amen. How cool is that, right? It's so awesome. I just thank God. I mean, that mean doesn't you don't have to be a rocket scientist to do this. All you have to do is be open and ask him, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Glory be to God. All right, so now, eight days after the day of Pentecost, we see Philip carrying the gospel to the people in Samaria. And we had read this earlier, but we didn't read the beginning portion, just the latter. So I'm going to put the beginning part of the story in here for you. This is in Acts chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria, and he preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and they that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Verse 12, But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, 
and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And then now here you see the verse that we'd already gone over where um, the apostles went to Samaria and they said, we never even heard of the Holy Spirit. And he gave them, he, they, he prayed for them. In verse 17, then laid their excuse me, then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw, this is a Simon in the Bible that had some bad motives there. <laughs> he saw that the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, and he offered them money. And he said, give me this power, that whomsoever I lay hands on may receive the Holy Ghost. Why did he say that? Because he saw them speaking in other tongues. And so he could see the power being demonstrated right there, and he wanted to have a piece of the action. He was rebuked. Don't worry. You can go and read that yourself. That's on Acts 8, 14 through 20. But I just wanted to give you that example also in the notes. About 10 years after Pentecost, Peter went to Cornelius' house. We read this already. And um, I just wanted to give you just uh, down here under the verse where I listed. This is where that was the first Gentiles, the group of Gentiles to receive the Lord and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit too. They believed, they heard, they received the Holy Spirit, they spake with tongues and prophesied, and then they got baptized. What And, and when it says that they, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, the, Gentile, the Jews heard the Gentiles speak in tongues and magnify God, and, and that made an impact on them. See, the, see it's an outward sign. Everyone who is filled with the Holy Spirit has the ability to speak in other tongues. But see, the Holy Spirit, he's a gentleman. He's not going to force his way. If there's anything I really want to pour into your life is to let you know God loves you. He's not mad at you. He just wants you to come to him so he can help you with your life and uh, to serve him. And he equips us. He gives us all the equipment we need to be successful. He gave us his word. He gave us his spirit. You know, we've been born again. He, and he's not going to uh, say, he's not, it's not going to be like a power coming over you, shaking you, you know, to pray in the Spirit. It's just so simple. We just ask him to baptize us, Jesus. We ask Jesus to baptize us with the Holy Spirit, and he does. And then we speak, and we speak in other tongues by the utterance of the Holy Spirit. As I teach this class today, I will not be surprised that some of you who have not had your release yet, in fact, I believe God in Jesus' name, if you haven't prayed in tongues yet by the end of this class, baby, you'll be praying in the Spirit. Amen. So just stick with me here. All right. <clears throat> let's go down to, um, let's look at the Apostle Paul's infilling of the, of the Spirit in Acts chapter 9, verse 10. You know, remember Paul now, he was Saul of Tarsus, and um, he was a devout Jew. Um, a Pharisee, in fact, of the Pharisees, he, he called himself. And um, anyway, he, his conversion is here. Let's look at this. Acts 9, through 10 through 12, and then verse 17. And there was a certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight. And inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. Now what had happened, he had gone on his way. He was on, his, on the road to Damascus, and he had seen in a vision the Lord Jesus. And he became blinded. And so when he was praying, this is at the, right after that it all happened. In verse 17, oh, I'm sorry, let's, I didn't read verse 12. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias. See, now Ananias didn't even know anything until just now. And the vision and the, and the, and the dream had already, or the vision had already been given to Saul. God is so cool. He knew Ananias was going to do it. Yep. So it says here, and, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house. And putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared to thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. See, there's no tearing or waiting in these, in these instances where you see the Holy Ghost being poured out and the evidence of them speaking in other tongues and glorifying God and prophesying or whatever. There's no delay. There, I know in some denominations taught, teach to tarry and wait. But see, now that Jesus has come and the Holy Spirit has already been poured out, we don't have to wait anymore. 
You just need to be born again first. And then you can receive the Holy Spirit right now from right where you are, Jesus being the baptizer of the Holy Spirit. And we know that the Apostle Paul was filled because it says in 1 Corinthians 14, 18, which is a, a book that the Apostle Paul, it was a letter he had wrote to the church at Corinth. And he said in, in that verse, 14, 18, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than you all. See, speaking with tongues is an initial supernatural sign or evidence of the Holy Spirit's indwelling. It's the beginning of it all. Uh, it's like the doorway to the gifts of the Spirit. You want to be used more by God? Pray more in the Holy Spirit. It gets you tuned into Him. It's your connection. This is the bat line baby. You can just it's just like picking up the red bat phone to get to, <laughs> to the bat cave. So you want to talk to God and, and you want to pray right, just pray. In the, if you're not sure, pray in the Holy Ghost. It's your direct connection to the Lord. God is a spirit. We're spirit beings. So when we pray in the spirit, we're like making a direct connection. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, so 10 reasons why the believer should speak in tongues. Now, I've got, I got these points out of one of my favorite little booklets we used to pass out when people got filled with the Holy Spirit here that went into the detail, some of it which I've come, covered today. He brought out 10 reasons that I just stole it right from him and gave him credit. I gave him credit one time. No, I'm just kidding. It's in your notes there. Number one, why should a believer be speak in tongues? Because tongues are the supernatural evidence of the Spirit's indwelling. It's the initial sign. And we've read these scriptures, and I'll just read them again. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And Acts 10, 46, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. All right, the second reason is for spiritual edification. Why should a believer speak in tongues? For spiritual edification. Let's look at these verses in 1 Corinthians 14, 2, 4 through 5, and verse 14. I kind of put them all together on your paper for you. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. How be it in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. In, in the Greek, that actually says divine secrets. Hallelujah. In the spirit, you speak divine secrets. It's like, you know, I always think of it's, it's a covert operation, you know. We go behind enemy lines. Okay, it might be a known tongue to somebody, but it's unknown to us. When it says speaking in other tongues, it's, it's not a known tongue to the speaker. That's the main thing you need to know. Yeah, it might be some dialect in some other country, but the, per the speaker does not know the dialect. And it doesn't really matter what dialect it is. If it's praying in tongues, you know you're going to pray the perfect will of God. You're praying divine secrets. All right? And so it's kind of like going behind enemy lines. You can pray. You can, because see, your understanding is limited, but we're going to go into that. All right, I'm not going to preach. I'm just going to teach this, and let's read the scripture. <laughs> How be it in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Verses 4 through 5, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. See, it's okay that your understanding doesn't know what you're praying. Okay, so to the intellect, an intellectual man might say, that's crazy. And I'm an intellectual, and I, I never, see now, I'm so blessed. I didn't have to get rid of denominational teaching, old stuff that maybe wasn't true. All I knew was I was, I had served the devil, and I was done, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, went to lots of parties and went to lots of bars. We didn't, we didn't see people pe speaking in tongues there, no, no. But in the church, they were. And, and do you know my experience with being baptized with the Holy Spirit I got born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, and called to preach August 22nd, 1982. It was interesting. I had never even heard of such a thing. Never even heard of speaking in tongues. Are you kidding me? No, never heard of it. And so I went to this church. I got, I got born again there. And after church, they had a uh, picnic area in the back um, behind their building. And so every, there was a big fellowship day. I don't know what they were doing, but I was there, and that's when I got saved. And so I went outside after the service was over, and there was food and that kind of thing uh, and drinks and stuff like that. And so I was sitting on the lawn, and I remember looking at the grass, and I thought to myself, the grass is so beautiful. It was never so green. It was so beautiful to me. And the flowers and the trees, everything looked different to me. That was my experience of being born again. Well, so then while I was there, they asked me, do you want to get filled with the Holy Ghost? I said, is it from God? 
because <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know nothing. <laughs> and they said, yes. I said, okay. So I sat down in a chair, and they were, they were trying to do it the Bible way and be all sweet like I'm trying to do with you here and give me scripture. So they were, the, like, there was a guy sitting on one side of me and another one, and, and they were, he started reading scriptures. And then he says, okay, so we're going to pray. And they went to have me pray. And I got baptized in the Holy Ghost just like that and began speaking in tongues. And I've been doing it ever, si <laughs> ever since. I guess I didn't know enough to get in the way, which is a good thing. And it's not to say that good denomina denominational teaching isn't good. It just makes sure as long as it's Bible and it's not man's doctrine, but it's Holy Ghost doctrine from the word of God, rightly divided. All right, so anyway, but I didn't know what, what I was praying, but it was such a move of God. I knew it was God. I didn't know what I was saying, and it didn't matter to me. I was, I was drunk, baby. I was drunk in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I was filled with the Spirit. It was wonderful. So if you are not filled with the Holy Spirit, I want to encourage you to stick with me for a few more minutes here as we finish this class, and I'm going to pray with you. And you can be filled right now, right today, with your heavenly language, and with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you'll have your heavenly language too. It goes with it. You know, he brings and gives us the utterance. All right, so, and I was, I think, in uh, 8, 4 through 5, in 1 Corinthians 14, 4 through 5, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. All right, and then in verse 14, now this is in the Amplified, and I love the way it says because it brings so much clarity. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit by the Holy Spirit within me. That unclouds a little bit of it, right? My spirit by the Holy Spirit within me prays. Now, it doesn't say that the Holy Spirit takes over your tongue and your lips and your vocal cords and makes you do anything, right? No. My spirit by the Holy Spirit within me prays. But my mind is unproductive. It bears no fruit and helps nobody. See, it's not an intellectual flow. This is a, this is a holy thing. It is a, is a prayer language given to us. The utterance comes from the Holy Spirit himself, part of the Godhead. This is divine. It's beautiful. You can't mess it up unless you get in the way. <laughs> but if you just relax and let the Lord have his way, it's going to be fine. And you're going to watch. You'd be powerful in the spirit. And this is, what, this is the, what's kept me. I thank God I was filled with the Holy Spirit the same day I got saved because I was messed up. Yep, I was really a mess. Yep. But God is good, and he, and he has no respecter of persons. And what he's done for one, he'll do for all. He is a good God. God is a spirit. When we pray in tongues, our spirit is in direct contact with God. He is a spirit too, see. We are talking to him by a divine supernatural means. All right, so the first reason we want to be, speak in tongues is because it's the natural, supernatural evidence of the spirit's indwelling. The second is for spiritual edification. The third reason is that tongues remind us of the spirit's indwelling presence. John 14, 16 through 17 and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter. Who was the first comforter? Jesus. It was Jesus. This is Jesus speaking here to his disciples. He's going to give you another comforter. Besides me, uh, he's going to give you another one. That he may abide with you forever. This is familiar, I know, but we're going to go over it again. Even the spirit of truth. So there's no lie. There's no darkness in him at all, right? He's the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. The world cannot receive him, so don't expect your worldly friends to get it. It's okay. They're not going to. These things are spiritually discerned, not natural. It's spiritual. And there's a big difference. Okay? So even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. Amen. The fourth reason that we should pray in tongues is praying in tongues is praying in line with God's perfect will. And I know these are familiar scriptures since we talked about the Holy Spirit last week, but this is in order that we go over this here. In Romans 8, 26 through 27, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities or our weaknesses, would be another way to say that in the, from the Greek word, our weaknesses, our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself, I like to say himself, he's a he, He's not an it. Maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Sometimes there's just no words, you know. But thank God for the Holy Ghost. 
Verse 27, and he that searcheth the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now you see how you can pray perfectly for that person that you just are at a loss of what to pray anymore because you've seen them hit their head up against the wall so many times and you love them and you want them to be saved and you just ran out of words to pray. Well, that's okay. You got the Holy Ghost. He will make intercession according to the will of God for that person, whether it's you're praying for yourself or whoever you're praying for. Thank God for the ministry of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues that we can pray the perfect will of God when our mind doesn't know what to pray for. It's a good, wonderful, beautiful thing, right? So number five, what's another reason that we should, that we should pray in tongues? Because praying in tongues stimulates your faith. Jude 20, there's no chapters in Jude. There's only one chapter. Well, there's one chapter, I should say. And this is in Jude chapter 1, verse 20. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. So you, so, so you can see that it stimulates your faith when you pray in the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you what, it's just like charging a battery in a car, okay? It used to be that. I don't know if they still do it this way. With cars, have changed so much, you know, but it used to be if your battery went dead, you can just charge it in the garage with one of those chargers that you plug into the, <laughs> into the DC, AC, DC, whatever. Anyway, you just charge it up overnight, and the next day it'll turn over, right? That's kind of how it is in the spirit when, you, when it comes to the things of God. You know, sometimes you feel run down, you need a refreshing, you need to edify your faith, you're standing in faith for a particular thing, and you need a breakthrough baby, you can pray in the Holy Spirit. When you pray in tongues, you are building yourself up on your most holy faith. You're building yourself up. You're charging up yourself. Building yourself up. Is, charging yourself is another way to say that. Amen. And so that's another reason. What's another reason? Number six, speaking in tongues is a means of keeping free from worldly contamination. How do we get contaminated in the world? Well, it comes through our thought life through our, and through our words, what we say. But one way you can keep yourself is to follow this course. Look in 1 Corinthians 14, 27 through 28. If any man speak in an unknown tongue. Now, this is referring to public worship, by the way. When you're going in your Bible and you're reading through and you see where it says that, uh, you'll find it says forbid not to speak with tongues. Number one, it'll tell you to forbid not to speak with tongues. But then you'll find where it says, well, if there's no interpreter, let him keep silent. But he's talking in these scriptures, this is talking about public worship. When we're in a public worship, um, then you, if you're going to speak in the spirit, if you're going to pray, if you're going to give a tongues, you need to have the interpretation or there needs to be an interpreter for public worship, but not for private prayer. This is not about private prayer. But what I wanted you to see in this is it says there, <clears throat> if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three and that by course and let one interpreter. But if there, is, if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. So we see praying in tongues is something that you can pray. You speak in tongues to yourself and to God. This is one of the things. You stimulate your faith, but also this will keep you free. If you can pray in tongues and speak to yourself and to God in a public worship, you can do it at home. You could do it at work. You can do it in your car. But, you know, don't, don't be foolish and cast your beautiful pearls before, people who, the, before swine, the Bible says. It, you know, if they're not saved, don't do scary, spooky stuff. You know, don't freak people out. Don't walk up to them and start praying the Holy Ghost. You're going to freak them out. They're going to think you're nuts. This is for your private life, see? Don't be ashamed of the Spirit now. I'm not saying that either. I'm just saying, you know, you, there's a lot of foolishness sometimes just for, you know, zeal without knowledge or whatever. We get excited. And so, but, but it says here that we speak to ourselves and to God. It is so, when I say this is what's part of what's kept me all these years through some, some hairy stuff, I tell you what, but I pray in the Spirit a lot. And it does, and you know, you can whisper, you can you can holler. Yeah, You can sing it. Right? Or you can and you can do all this in your understanding with what you know. But if you don't know what else and you're still needing that breakthrough, tap into using your personal prayer language for worship. You can do it and we'll we'll see some more. This is gonna go right into some another point I want to cover. All right, number seven. Praying in tongues enables us to pray for the unknown. This is so helpful 
for us when we don't know what to pray for. And we've covered that. For I pray, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. And that it's okay because God is moving. And you'll see the fruit. You'll see it. You'll see it. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 2.11 says, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him. All right? We don't even know ourselves half the time, right? But the Holy Ghost knows us. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. So there again, where your intellect stops, God is bigger than your intellect. There's so much we don't know. And so when we pray in the spirit, we can pray for things we maybe don't know, and but yet we are praying accurately. All right, number eight, praying in tongues gives re- spiritual refreshing. So when you're feeling like your battery is low, so as I used that analogy from earlier, you, you know, and you're drained, you feel just drained, you need a refreshing, you know, you might, you probably need to worship. <laughs> Praise and worship will break that usually on the spot. And also, you can pray in tongues for spiritual refreshing. And we see in Isaiah 28, verse 11 through 12. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his people, to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest, wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. But we hear and we receive so if you need some refreshing, just pray until you get the breakthrough. Just pray and, you know, when you say until you get the breakthrough, what does that mean, Pastor Laura? What that means is that when you pray and you press in the Spirit, and you're praying in, the, you're praying in tongues, sometimes you feel that fire behind it. Just, oh, da da ba It's like you just, you just want to get it out. So you just got to pray. Just pray and pray. And then after a while, you'll see it starts to ease and your tongues be a little more freer. And that refreshment comes. That's when you know you got the answer. You pray until you've prayed it through, the old mamas used to tell us in the church. Pray it through, baby. you got to pray through. What does that mean? You pray until you get the release. Sometimes it takes a while. And it doesn't have to always be done in one setting, you know, but it's good to pray until you get the breakthrough if you can, if you have the time to do it. But sometimes you just have to table and say, Lord, I thank you that it's done by faith in Jesus' name. And then you come back the next time and you take up that prayer, you know, intercession, whatever you're believing God for and praying for, you'll find that refreshment kick in. I thank God for that. We need that in these days. These are crazy days that we live in, and there's a lot of pressure out there, and we don't want to get weary in well-doing, and sometimes it's a matter of stepping back off of what we're doing for just a moment, saying, Lord, I just love you. I just want to take a few minutes to worship you. I just want to praise you, and you just start praying and worshiping in the Spirit. It's like oil in the soul. Just the refreshment comes from the spirit of grace. Thank God for that. Um, all right, so verse uh, number nine. I was going to say verse nine. All right, number nine. Why else should we pray in tongues? Did you know that praying in tongues, you can give thanks that way? But this is for private prayer, <laughs> and I'll, you'll see why here. What is it then? In verse, this is 1 Corinthians 14, 15 through 17. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. See? That was just what I was talking about. Glory to God. Else, when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks? seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. Verse 17, for thou verily givest thanks well. See, it says that you're giving thanks well, but the other person is not edified. All right, so you don't, this is back to, you don't want, this is Pastor Laura's interpretation. You know, don't do crazy stuff to scare people. <laughs> you know, but it is, it says that you give thanks well. If you're by yourself, say, Lord, I receive this with Thanksgiving. You know, you can do what you want when you're with you and the Lord. I just want to encourage you just not to scare away the fish. All right, amen. Number 10, speaking in tongues brings the tongue under subjection for all of you old sailors out there of which I was one of those members, boy, I had anointing to cuss. I was just a bad cusser. Whew. I used to curse all the time. Every other word was the F word. It was just terrible. But, you know, God got it. And when I first got saved, you know, a lot of it went away, but not all of it. It just was an ingrained habit, you know. So how did I break that habit? Well, I started confessing the word. I got scriptures that, that 
I loved that just were blessing me, promises in the Bible. And I would highlight them with my highlighter. And every day I go through my Bible and I just read those out loud. I still do that to this day. You know, the scriptures may change, but the word of God, the habit, the practice of this doesn't. And um, that's one way. And the other way is because I pray in the Spirit a lot. See, when you pray in the Spirit, you are yielding your spirit, your tongue to the Holy Spirit to give you the utterance to pray. The more you do it, you're yielding one of the members of your body. You know, when we get into the body of Christ, which we'll be going, this lesson kind of takes up the path into the gifts of the Spirit. And we'll be talking about your different gifts in the body and that kind of thing. But you'll find when, we, when you read, in the, in, especially in 1 Corinthians, and it talks about the body of Christ, and members in particular, uses the word members a lot. And it talks about here in the, in the book of James that the tongue is an unruly, unruly member of your body, your physical body. And it's with your tongue that you speak out blessings and you speak out curses. <laughs> it comes from the tongue. It's an unruly member of your body. And in James 3, 8, it says, but the tongue can no man tame. No man can tame the tongue. No man. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. And you know that's right because if you hear somebody cut, you know, somebody says bad and icky things to you, it feels like poison in your spirit. It's like, ugh. You know, who needs that? But um, as we yield our tongue in praying in tongues, and we yield our tongue to the utterances of the Holy Spirit, you are practicing giving your one of your, the members of your body, your tongue, your lips, yielding that to the Holy Spirit. That's a great principle for starting. You know, I used to do, and it might sound crazy to you, but I was just desperate to get it right with God, you know. And I wanted to just cuss up my ex-husband. Oh, something awful. <laughs> I did. A couple times I actually did it, too. I repented, though. I'm, it's under the blood. Glory to God. Amen. But what I would do is when I wanted to cuss <laughs> and give him a piece of my mind and tell him what I really thought, I would just walk away and go, I'd have to go in the other room because I didn't want him to think I was talking to him because we all know we're talking to God when we pray the Spirit, right? Okay, so I'm talking to God. And I'm praying in the Spirit, and I'm yielding my members, my tongue, my lips, my vocal cords to, this, to the Holy Spirit so that I won't cuss. Yeah. But you know what happens is after a while you practice that, it helps you bring it into control. It helps you discipline your It's just like fasting. The more you pray in the Spirit, the more you're teaching your tongue how to be used for good things. The more you confess your, the Word of God. You're teaching your mouth to speak the blessing, not the curse. What we say is very important. Even if you're not cursing or cussing, you know, there's still poison that you can be released through just speaking situation instead of the word. You know, bringing things, making covenants with ourselves through our words. I swear I'll never do that again. Watch what you say over yourself. We make covenants and with ourselves, and we put laws into motion that can't be broken by anyone but us and our permission to God. People who are in comas sometimes, this, you see this a lot when you minister the sick a lot. Um, and I've ministered to lots of sick people and, and people in comas in the ICU and stuff. And they tell you, the, the nurses will tell you they can hear you. Um, and I've heard many ministers talk about this as well, is where, you know, this person, in fact, you know, my daughter's, my daughter's father, I could even say this is his Kind of what happened to him, he died a day before he was going to turn 25, the day before. And he used to say, I'll never live past, I forgot what it, which number it was, but it was like 30 or 21, or I don't remember what it was. But he used to say that all the time, I'll never live to be old. And he dishonored his parents, and that's, a, you know, that covenant says if you obey your parents, you'll live a long life on the earth, and it'll be well with you. Right, so he disobeyed his parents, and he spoke these words of death over himself. He made these covenants. I'll never live to, you know, my, my father, my stepfather did this. He said, I'll never live to be 60. And he died before his 60th birthday. He died at 59 and a half. Yes, he did. Am I saying that this is a good thing? No, I'm saying this is a bad thing. We've got to watch what we say. See, what happens, a lot of times people put laws into motion. They make these covenants and contracts with themselves. I know I'm off my notes, but that's okay. This is good. Watch what you say over yourself and over your relationships and things like that. Because once you go ahead and you start saying that stuff, and then you get into a situation where you can't verbally respond to take it back, there's not much anybody can do, really. It's got to be a miracle from God. And I don't know how he does all that. But uh, I do know that um, 
your will is a big player and a big key and a big part as to where you are in with your walk with God, how much you've yielded and surrendered to him, there are things we says, I won't do that. I will not. Well, once you say, I will not, everybody has to stop and take five steps back because it's your will. You've been given that from God. It's a holy thing that you have control. Of. God didn't make us puppets. So, so as you pray in the spirit and you speak with other tongues, you learn to discipline that tongue of yours. Not just in cursing, but in words of death and speaking things that you should not. Learn to be quiet. And, you're, and this is coming right from the chatterbox of the century. <laughs> they said that in my, in my kindergarten all the way through. So, you know, I talk a lot. Okay, so this is, what I, this is who I am. But then I found out, as long as I have something good to say, as long as I have a word in my mouth to bring, and it's something of substance, and it's okay as long as it's in order. And how do we get it in order? Well, we speak the word, and we pray in the spirit a lot. That's one way to control that mouth of yours. So that was a, that was a key for you. All right, so now I took this for the end of our lesson here, and I'm not going to go through. You'll find, well, now I'm on, um, what page is this? It's at the bottom. It's in the middle of page five. This is how to actually receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And because it's almost five o'clock now, and I don't want to go over in our time, I'm going to leave that for you to read. It will give you a lot of clarity. And there's a prayer in red there for you. And what I want to do right now is I just want to... Um, close this class with going over this prayer so that if you're watching this in our archives or if you're right now live in our chat room and I can see, hey, everybody, it's good to see you this wonderful afternoon. If you would like to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the first most important thing is that you be born again. You must be born again. So I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. <laughs> Amen, Terry. Um, I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And uh, repeat this prayer after me if you would like to do that. And you just have to mean it. That's the only thing. And, and, the, and the Lord will answer your prayer. Say, Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. You said if I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, I would be saved. Jesus, you are Lord. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me out loud to God, then you are born again. That's what the Bible calls being born again. God comes in, and he takes you up on your offer. Now, there's a subsequent baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that is next for you. And I would like to lead you in a prayer to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit if you have not yet done so. Then just pray this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I am a believer. I am your child and you are my father. Jesus is my Lord. I believe with all my heart that your word is true. Your word says... If I will ask, I will receive the Holy Spirit. So in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord, I am asking you, fill me to the overflowing with your precious Holy Spirit. Jesus, baptize me in the Holy Spirit. Because of your word, I believe that I now receive, and I thank you. Thank you for it. I believe the Holy Spirit is within me, and by faith I accept it. Now, Holy Spirit, rise up within me as I praise God. I fully expect to speak with other tongues as you give me the utterance. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, what I want you to do as an act of your faith is to begin speaking, but don't speak in English. You just speak. It's your voice. It's your tongue. It's your lips. 
but the Holy Spirit's going to give you the words. And your prayer life is going to, your, your tongues is going to sound different than everybody else's because just like we're individuals and everything else, our prayer language is specific for us. You just pray in the Spirit. Pray out loud. Pray in tongues. Come on. Pray with me. I see y'all in the live chat room right now. Come on now, pray with me. So don't speak in English. Just by faith. And what I used to tell the kids in children's church, I would say, now look, I want you to begin to speak, but don't speak in English. I want you to pretend, because you got to bypass the intellect. I want you to pretend that you're speaking in Spanish and you already know how to do it and you're just going to do it. Ready? Go. Boom. Or whatever language, you know, German, French, whatever. Something you didn't know before. And so then we begin to pray, we need, and we speak in other tongues as the Spirit gives us utterance. And just know, sometimes it just seems so weird to us to hear. We hear this word, no, it doesn't even sound like I'm doing it right. No, 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 it's okay. God is faithful. He said, if, any, if, you're, if, if your son is hungry, are you going to give, when he asks you for a fish, are you going to give him a serpent? No, right? If, if he's hungry, are you going to give him uh, and he asks for bread, are you going to give him a rock? No. How much more will your father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? God is good. He loves you. When you ask him to fill you with the Holy Spirit, that is what you're going to get. In fact, all heaven's going to make sure, baby, you are not getting anything else but the Holy Spirit. So you don't have to worry about some strange, weird thing. This is holy, but it's simple. Really, because it's all a matter of just like when you were saved, you received the Holy, you received Jesus as your Savior. Now you receive the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And what? And see, you don't have to wait for the emotions to be there because your emotions come and go. You know, sometimes I'm in love with my husband. Sometimes I want to kick him to the curb. Right? I mean, it doesn't. You know, same thing with your kids. You love them. You want to wring their neck. Right? Well, you can't depend on emotions. So it's. But this is. This is what we do. We just we practice by just praying in the Spirit. We know that this utterance comes from the Holy Spirit and nothing else, nowhere else, because God's going to protect us and make sure that nothing else gets in there. He's a good Father, and He loves you. So you don't have to worry about that. Just be like a little child and receive what He has for you. And I want to encourage you to set some time aside every day to pray in the Spirit. You know, just for five minutes. You know, or when you're in your car driving, just turn off the radio for a few minutes and just pray in the Spirit for a while. You can praise Him that way, and it's beautiful. Lord, I just want to, sometimes you know how when you're worshiping God and you're praising Him, you just run out of words. Lord, I just want to praise you and thank you. You're so good. You're so wonderful. Look, for me to teach this lesson, I had to lay aside all my pride and say, now look, I know this is in the Bible and it's beautiful and holy, because this this goes all over the world, right? This is we're on YouTube, we're on Ustream, we're all over. And if I and if I had to worry about what my my mind thought, oh, you can't depend on all that. You have to have what pa- pastor calls it a regimen of faith. You have to have a regimen of faith where you get up and you pray every day, no matter how you feel, baby, you get up and you pray. Why? Cuz you love God and this is one thing you're doing to help yourself to establish your relationship with him, to connect with him. Right? So you pray, you spend time in the Bible every day, you read your word, read your word every day, five minutes, right? And so this is what we do because we want to make sure we are developing in the things of God and that we're not going to come, by and come back, fall behind in any good thing that the Lord has for us. And that means that we have to exercise our faith. And part of that is prayer, part is reading the word, and then, of course, our ministry to others. And this is how we grow and develop in our walk with God. So I just want to thank you for tuning in today to Cyber Church. We love you. We pray for you every day. And we believe God is, is doing a great work with you, all you believers all across this beautiful globe that God made for us, this place we call Earth, this, this temporary home. <laughs> Hallelujah. And um, we'll be back here next week at 4 o'clock. And I just want to tell you I love you, and God bless you. Bye-bye.